Hey, it's Doodle Bud here. Ben Walsh from uh, Gravitas Pens and I thought maybe we should do a deep dive on what it takes to make a fountain pen from scratch, at least from his perspective, from his process that he does. So we went through the whole thing start to finish, how you come up with the design, how you do that, choosing materials, coatings, getting the right manufacturers and doing the quality control, delivering this uh, the, to the end user as well. So we went pretty deep. Hope you enjoy it. Let us know in the comments if this is something you'd like to see again in the future as well. Also, I want to apologize up front with the audio. I did all my checks and balances. Everything sounded great. And then the audio, when I got the final recording, was pretty bad. So try to I'll try to do better next time. And I also want to clarify, too, uh, in no way I wasn't paid to do this video. I'm not getting a kickback from Ben for any pens he sells or anything like this. This is just him and I chatting design, chatting engineering when it comes to fountain pens. So with that all said, let's get it started. Everything started. You sent me some pens. I guess you came across my channel. And you sent me some pens and I got your pens. And I'm like, these are really sweet. And it was really cool as I reached out to you to ask some questions and you just responded to everything. And then we just like kind of blow down on engineering and design and uh, machine shops and coatings or just whatever measurement tools. And uh, so I thought we should, we should chat a little bit how we chat over Instagram or whatever, and just maybe explain how pens are made a little further depth than I, you know, sort of seen. So I thought, let's, let's do this. And you're like, absolutely. So, uh, Luke, yes. Yeah. I, it, I, it, it, from, from the get go, it actually loves the detail that you went into and um, you properly nerded out on these things. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the kind of depth that I like to go into or the, yeah. the times I can't really go into that kind of depth on, um, my Instagram and on my of course. On my website, it's just too much. It's too much information. But there's my chance. To go yeah. It lets us kind of just uh, like talk shop. Let's kick things off. Maybe give yourself a little introduction. I thought we'd do a couple minutes each. And then we're going to kind of do a breakdown, sort of a, a, an example of how you design a pen, right? So let's uh, let's go with you first, Ben. Just chat a little bit about yourself. And yeah. So uh, my name's Ben Walsh. I'm the owner of Gravitas Pens. Um, Basically, I am a one-man band, so I do everything. Um, the, the, the designing, and quality control, prototyping, marketing, sales. So uh, I'm kind of going to go into detail about how I do what I do. Um, more detail than I've ever gone into before. So um, I'm going to talk about a bit about my background, um, how I actually design names, how I get my ideas. Um, how to do quality control, how to ship everything. Um, I'm, I'm going to even talk about my, my failures. I'm going to talk about all my successes. Because, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not this wonder kid. So I want to, I want to let everybody know that I've made mistakes and have I come and, um, come successful from my mistakes, basically. My introduction. Cool. <laughs> oh, it's a doodle bush. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, a little about me, uh, injury and background. I got lucky uh, where I got to kind of study everything. I studied formerly computer hardware engineering, so designing like microprocessors and how to make an electron go from here to there. But uh, I really wasn't interested in that in the field. So, I did a lot of mechanical. This all had to do with instrumentation and lasers. So, electrical, mechanical, optical systems whether it was making a laser shoot at something and make a little precise dot, sometimes hundreds of them per second with spinning things in particular shapes down to 10 microns. So that would be that angle, making lasers shoot something and control that. Or on the other side, using a laser to measure something. So whether it's, uh, you know, in a lab environment, a home, an office environment, or into heavy industrial, being on high-speed trains going 300 kilometers an hour and you know, super hot, super cold conditions. So it was always precision though, no matter the environment. So I was fortunate. I got to work across kind of everywhere, be in a chemistry lab one day, work in a scanning electron microscope or in the optics lab later on that afternoon. So just tons of fun stuff. And I don't do that anymore, but for some reason, pens got me kind of back into that where I really enjoy looking at a design of a pen, um, no matter if it's new or old. And so, uh, 
Yeah. Then all of a sudden I got to chat with you and you really like to talk about design and those little details. So, uh, yeah. So up ne- I think, uh, we've got a little intro info on each of us kind of backgrounds and what we're interested in and what we like to do. Um, so I thought we're going to thought, you know, we're going to go from, from design idea to how does that work for you? Like, how does that start off? Just like you have an idea to make a pen, but people understand it's a blank screen. There's nothing you're starting with. It's SolidWorks, nothing on there and you got to do it all. So talk, walk us through that. Well, I, I probably should talk about my experience as well, how I'm actually mm-hmm. to this point. So, um, I'm a qualified designer, but I actually qualified in interior furniture design. Um, but the principles are the same. Um, I also have a degree in fine art and I'm a, a cabinet maker. So, so I've got a few different things that I've done and that's kind of given me the experience, um, in the industry to be able to do what I do, but I'll go back to when I was 12. This is where it all began. So in, um, we call it a secondary school in Ireland, but we use what we call it high school. So in high school, um, at the age of 12, and um, I got to pick my subjects and my subjects were, um, you know, we, we have kind of different subjects in Ireland then and most countries would have, but I did this thing called technology um, and technical drawing. So technology was learning about robotics and CNC machines work and works. So I got to learn about G code, robotics and CNC lathes from the age of 12 and then technical drawing. That's all about draftsmanship, how you actually make the drawings and how you do, um, a 2d plan and view elevation how to do isometric drawings and that. Uh, so from the age of 12, that's when I actually, the seed was set, I suppose. And then as you go further along in school, you, uh, you get more advanced in these subjects and technology turns into, um, engineering, um, or you could call it metal work. Um, so I got to actually get on the lake, get on CNC machines. I got to actually, um, play with plastics. I started to play with acrylics, uh, Lexan, um, fairly really? early on. So I was only 15, 16 when I started to actually get on engineering lanes and CNC lanes and CNC routers and the advanced subject from uh, technical drawing was called design graphics and communications. So I actually was part of the pilot scheme. So it was the first ever um, introduction of this subject. And I was the, one of the first to do it. And so design graphics and communications was instead of doing drawings, paper, we got to do our technical drawings on computer. So we got to start to use SOLIDWORKS. So we got to, we, we started using CAD. I actually got to design, um, on CAD from the age of. 15, 16, I was actually 15. So I was using SOLIDWORKS and I was getting taught SOLIDWORKS professionally that early on. And it's been so valuable to me this day. And like one of my first ever assignments, I had to design a, a Wii, a Wii remote and we had to design the injection molds for the Wii remote. Now that's a big thing to do. That's not an easy, uh, easy project. There's a lot of details that go to yeah, that. Yeah. So the seed was set that early on. Then I went into uh, college. I originally wanted to be going a mechanical engineer, but I decided to go down to fine art route instead. And, and while I was doing fine art, I was working part time as a cabinet maker. I originally used to sweep the floors, but I, I worked with Mayo both over a couple of years and I actually uh, became a cabinet maker. I don't actually have any qualifications as a cabinet maker, but I do have a qualification in furniture design and making. So it would be considered the same thing. So I don't actually have my actual cabinet making sir, but I know that to do all of it. I'm mm-hmm. in the industry. And I, and I should add that, um, I did work as a designer. So I actually worked as a material designer um, kitchen company. So we did that for a few years and as a cabinet maker, I actually designed a lot of the projects that we were doing. So we always needed, um, working drawings 
because I had the experience. They yep. landed that job. So you can do that. I was actually working as if making the drawings. So I was doing the CAD drawings for years and years. So I got brilliant industry experience. And I was doing some very, very high end jobs. I was doing uh, drawings for Microsoft, Facebook, Dow, some of the big tech companies. So I got some mm-hmm. good experience. And then when I became a designer, well, I should, have, I should add, I actually had an internship in a design company. And the design company was a lighting and furniture design company. And they also made awards. So I got to work with some crazy, crazy materials, some really crazy stuff. At one point we made um, a table from a decommissioned jet engine from Boeing 737. Oh, cool. And I got to work with the likes of acrylic and trophies. And I got to work with silver, copper, bronze, brass, Mm -hmm. all all the plastics. I got to do a lot of resin as well. Background. The the important thing with having like, I was kind of talking about it too earlier, but like having width and depth in a knowledge base, because you might not know much about those, some of those materials, but you just at least remember seeing them. And there was something called UHMW. You didn't know what it was, but you seen it. And then later on, you remember something about it, maybe five or 10, 15 years later, like, oh, wasn't there a thing called that material? You look it up and you learn about it and now you know what to do with it. So that's, what's really great is you just get so much exposure. Um, when you get introduced to so many different fields and materials and needs and end customers and stuff. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I do a lot of is I ask questions and if I see something new and I want to know about it, absolutely do I ask questions. I am, I, I say this all the time, but I'm relentless. If I want to know something, I'll ask questions and I'll find out something that knows the answer. And I won't stop until I get that answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's certainly very well to this thing. Yeah. So that's the cool thing is, you know, it wasn't overwhelming the idea of having to put a few parts together in SolidWorks to make a pen. You've maybe not made one before, but you could go, I could make the drawings. I know what to do. Um, but even just to that point, if you're a brand new person going, I want to make my own pen. Well, you could have pick a drawing platform, a CAD platform. <laughs> it's just now you got to learn a whole new language of yeah. how do I make a circle? How do I make it a little bit smaller? How do I, oh, I want to make an oval or I want to put a radius or I want to extrude it. I got to thread it. Oh, it's got to fit into this. Like there's a lot of commands now you got to use. So it was great. You had that experience already. Um, you just haven't used it to make, you know, this type of thing. You've made other stuff before. Oh yeah. And a lot of it is you need to know how to be able to speak to the manufacturers. So you need to know exactly what their capabilities are and you need to be able to design design to what they're able to do because Mm -hmm times people will design something absolutely mind-blowing, crazy designs. How do you make it? Like if you, if you make a skeletonized pen, if you don't have a certain type of CNC machine in, with some kind of live tooling or live access uh, milling machine, how are you actually going to make that? Yeah, it's game over. It's game over. So you need to know what the capabilities of your manufacturer is and you have to be designed to what they're capable to that. And in the beginning, I was designing crazy things and I'd go to a manufacturer and they'd say, yeah, sorry, we can't do that. And I was getting a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I had to learn and I just learned the hard thing. I was going and asking silly questions. Well, I'm glad I asked these silly questions. Because now you know. I know, I know, yeah. And um, I'm happy to share my knowledge too. So if anybody was to come to me and say, look, how do we do this? And uh, what do I not do? And I'll tell you exactly what not to do because I've made them mistakes. Mm-hmm. I'll help you not make the mistakes. Though. So we thought we would uh, kind of chat with some of the parts when it comes into uh, the initial part of the design. So maybe you have a few ideas as far as how something's going to look. You have an overall idea, but then the first thing you got to think of is the material. So yeah, yeah. yeah, so let's chat maybe a little bit about that, how you might pick one to be copper versus brass or steel or why you would do like on, on these pens here, you know, you have an aluminum body, but then you have a stainless steel section. So maybe chat a little bit about that, just material choice for a few minutes. Yeah. So, um, I will entry as an example, I actually yeah. have my pen here and that I actually, um, 
paste my entry around. And um, it's an SDJ. So it's a 1950s vintage SDJ. And the reason why I love this pen is it's, it's nice and small and agile. I've got big hands, so it, it, it's a bit too small for me, but it's how it performed. And I like it was a very nice, neat, agile pen and it did exactly what I needed it to do. But then the materials that this is made out of is um, cellulose. And, uh, it's a lever fill pen. And today we don't really have uh, cellulose anymore. We have better materials. Mm -hmm. We have better capabilities and we don't use lever action and filling mechanisms anymore as well. So we have converters or sometimes we have some pistons and vacuum fluid. So I took the principle out of very, very nice, neat, agile pen. And I wanted to make a modern version of that. And that's how the entry was born. So it's up with the sign brief of what I wanted the pen to do. So I wanted agile. I wanted it to be universal pen types. So and we have to consider the different hand sizes of different the different width of a section. So every every person is different. But universally, what is the average um, user going to want? And I had to consider what, what does 50% of the population have? And 50% of the population are women and they have smaller hands. But I didn't want to make a pen that was too small. So I went with something in the middle and that's where the entry was mm -hmm. Now I could have made the pen extremely light, could have made it from aluminium. I did make it from aluminium, but I could have made the section from aluminium as well. And I wanted it to be agile and that's where the weighted section comes in. So the weighted section makes it a uh, front forward. So it's weighted forward. And what that means is that you've got more control in your team. And you can wiggle it around there in your hands and you can feel that it's, it's quite agile. It's always going to do what you want it to do. It's not back weighted. You have to control. And that was the idea behind uh, the pen. So I just off that brief. But the pen also had to be, I wanted it to be flexible as well. But I didn't want it to just move gone. So I did a point of deep posting as well. And so the idea that I was going to make pocket pen version of this. Um, so to make a pocket pen, you designed the pen as a full size pen, and then you turned it into a pocket pen. So I already had the entry pen and the idea was to make the pen first, but I actually still went with the entry first. So that, that, you know, yeah, you actually have to, so that's the pocket version of the entry. Actually, do you know what you should do? Um, yeah. and then, I know what I should do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, dude, because, um, well, the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can put the pockets. Yeah, I'm on the entry. So the entry. So basically, yeah. you can tell that it's made from the same design. It's called design continuity. Yeah. So that was how I kind of came up with the pre design. I wanted it to do all those things. And I just, and I wanted it to be a, quite a slick body as well. So the, the, the SD is quite a slick body. So. And threads are basically machined into the body and there's no, there's no stop. But there's a hard stop on the inside of the cap. So I actually machine the hard stop on the inside of my cap. I did it five degree um, hard stop. So the section meets the inside of the cap at 45 degrees. And what that does is it seals the inner cap. So instead of having a, a, a cap liner, I cap itself is a cap liner, seals itself. As you know, a conical surface, meaning a conical surface will self-align and it will also self-seal. So that is why I've done it that way. Yeah, I actually brought up that exact principle with another maker who has reached out to me and he and uh, he was having issues with his stop. And I mentioned that exact same point, the conical surfaces. So it, it makes a just a slight little difference, but it's just a little bit better and all of a sudden, now, like your pens, there's no cap liner, but I, they, none of them dry out whatsoever. How about some other ones where they do dry out over time? Um, but that's one of the big differences. A tiny little detail like that may, can make a big difference. Yeah. And, oh, and the, um, the section as well. So I have the section designs, um, with micro groups and, um, 
I've seen it on a couple of pens before, and there's a very famous pen, the, the tactile turn fist, and that has micro proofs. Um, I didn't steal the idea, but it was just something that I wanted to do. I was experimenting with them using a laser to do micro groups or quite a lot of things in micro knurling on the pen. And it was just time consuming. So, um, a quicker, more cost effective way is the machine grooves into the pen. And that's why, why I went with that. Um, and yeah. another thing about the entry was, um, I wanted it to be a, a cost effective pen. And the material choice is why it is made from 6061 aluminium. So 6061 aluminium is actually a brand new material. It's very versatile. You can put many, many different colored coatings on it. So is it to pretty much any color you want? You can finish it to high polish. Bead blasted. I went with the bead blasted. And the bead blasted finish of that can be tougher than every other finish. And the reason for that is um, you, you, you blast the surface with tiny little glass beads. Sometimes it's metal beads, sometimes it's tungsten. But what that does is it cleans the surface and cleaning the surface actually slightly hardens the surface and it prepares it um, better for the surface. So, it's like a mini work hardening. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So yeah. when you, if you, you that's it. You, you work hard in the surface and it also makes for a nice matte texture. Um, so that's why I went with that finish and that material. And um, I, I, I did, um, expand on the material choice later down the line, but uh, the, I'm always going to offer the entry pen as the most affordable pen I can. And materials are going up. The cost of materials are increasing. So. It's always going to be based on the economy of the pen, but I make it as, a, as affordable as I can. Mm -hmm. So then, I um, that was all part of the design brief. I wanted it to be an affordable entry level pen. So I didn't want to make a crazy expensive pen. I wanted everybody to have a chance to be able to get a fountain pen, high quality, well machined fountain pen that as many people would be uh, happy to use and that is where you know, that, that was my design process. One thing too, just like with coatings is another thing is most aluminum pens. So like here I have, um, like the Lamy Dialog three, there's a lot of other, you know, a lot of times the metal pens are aluminum, but it's always just anodized, but you, yeah. you're a crazy coatings guy. And it's just yeah. like almost everyone just anodizes, which there's nothing wrong with anodized. You know, it's a great, it's a great coating, but there are so many other coatings. And the fact that you use other materials, so you, you got like stainless steel going on and uh, you're experimenting with some plastics and all sorts of other things right now. Um, there's a whole other coatings world and, and it seems like where you get some of that inspiration is, is actually in the machine shop. So you have all these tools and they could be tungsten carbide or hardened steel, all this, a lot of, almost all of them, like it's rare you have an uncoated tool, but they have a coating on there to help with lubricity, with cutting and also saving the, uh, the longevity of your tooling as well. So you're not burning it out so fast. So it's all being used there and it costs next to nothing to coat these tools. So they do big batches and you're just like, why can't I just do what we do in the machine shop, do it on a pen. And the coating is mega strong. Like anodizing is great, but like you, you get a titanium nitride coating. Like we're, we're getting kind of getting up the scale towards diamond for hardness. So if, if people worry about an anodizing, getting scratched by your keys, trust me, some of those coatings, they, they can handle your keys. It's, it's no problem. It's a super, super durable coating. Well, um, anodized aluminum, um, if you, if you have a brass key, you can scrape it on yeah. it. Yeah. That brass will completely come off and it won't damage the anodizing. So, um, I, I, so there's this thing called the, the, the hardened scale or the Vickers hardened scale. And then if you were to look at the hardened scale, it goes from zero to 10,000. 10,000 being diamond, zero being water, I suppose. And anodized aluminum, I believe that anodized aluminum is close to 400. Yeah. Maybe 300. Same you need a hard anodized anodize as well. Yeah. So there's actually different types of anodized. Yeah. There's type one, two, and three. And um, type one is more decorative, type two is decorative and hard coating. And then type three is a very, very hard. Um, you, you can't really do many colors with yeah. like 
but it's a very hard, very resistant building. You don't need a pen to be as resistant as type three. Not as pretty looking. So yeah. And really most um sixty sixty one is type two anodized. I'm sure there's another type of anodizing, but I've only really explored type two great detail. Mm-hmm. And to touch on coatings, yeah, I, I'm big into my coatings and people will actually um have these coatings everywhere and they don't even realize. Yeah. Coatings are in your bathroom, in your kitchen, or in your car. If you're wearing a watch, it's more than likely a watch. Even on your phone, the the, the on your your phone screen, there's a there's coatings everywhere, and it's and the probably, camera lenses and the optics. Yeah, like it's in the optics. It's in if you it's even on plastics. So you 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 see some of that um, chrome plated plastics. That's a PVD coating. Um, you might so everybody might have seen and gold drill bits. That's actually titanium nitride. Then once again, that's a PVD coating. It's absolutely everywhere. Modern day uh, chrome plating is actually PVD coated polished brass. It's not actually um, chrome anymore. There is PVD coatings and have pretty much replaced a lot of the chrome plating these days. Yeah, and I love. There's a lot more to play with than just anodizing and, and you're aware of that stuff. And yeah, that's really like, Hey, and they got some great properties and then you get totally cool, different finishes, especially like on a section, it's that real shiny, glossy black that you just can't get that with anodizing, which makes us look super slick too. So. And it's actually, uh, that is really tough. That as well. that, that mm-hmm. Another important thing to notice is, um, the coating is only going to be as tough as the material underneath. But if you have copper. And you put um, a titanium nitrate coating on the copper, you know, the copper is still going to dent because it's coating is only four and you know, it's four nanometers. Yeah. And it's very, very thin, very, very hard. It still take a dent. So if, if you're going to coat something, do a relatively hard material, like a 304 stainless steel, or, and I'm working on a very, very, um, high end. Aluminium at the moment, it's very, very, very strong aluminum and it's as hard as steel, but it's as light as aluminium. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very important with the base materials as well. Um, we chatted, moving on to sort of how do you find out if you have a good idea or not? So you might have yeah. your overall idea of what the pen was going to look like, what you're going to make it out of the coatings. You're like, okay. I, th- I love it. You're designing it. You, of course, you're going to love it, right? You're, it's your baby. But then yeah. you go, is it, is it just a pen for me or are other people going to think, you know, putting laser etching on a pen is cool or changing materials or cool, uh, anodizing, uh, or, uh, you know, coatings and stuff like that, or just overall shape, you know, you have no idea. So how do you go about doing that? You're a one man show. How do you do that? So, um, social media is very important. And um, so I have, um, I'm very active on social media and um, I use my, my Instagram as basically my design alone and also use it to get feedback from the community. I also have several trusted people in the industry that I will share my designs and ideas with before I show the public. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be able to get a good information of what, what people don't like. So say if I was to post a picture of a pen and it's, it's brown, it's not a nice color. If I don't get a good reaction from that. I know. No problem. Probably not a good idea to me, but say I post a picture of a new finish and I get a really good reaction and people start asking me questions and it's something that nobody's ever seen before. Then I know that's something that I should investigate further. Yeah. Sometimes I just know that, um, there's certain things in the industry that are always going to do well. So, um, certain finishes, uh, yeah. like for example. A black pen is always going to sell well. I don't need to add, it's just something that we know in the industry. So a black pen, a black is always going to match. It, it matches with a lot of things. And, and when people can't choose, they just go for black. It's a, it's easy. So I don't need to ask people what to think of this black pen. But if, I, if I'm doing something crazy, like uh, the rainbow, it's good to uh, finish pens. When I post that, I've always wanted to do it. But I thought, you know, it's a bit too, 
a bit too out there, a bit too adventurous. But when I did post pictures of it, I got a really good reaction. And from the reactions, I built on that. And that's how I uh, explored it further. Um, I, I did polls, I did stories, I did posts, and I got feedback. And from the feedback, I, um, I implemented it into my designs. And it's actually been my most successful finish. And in the future, I'm still going to always do that. I want to get the, the community involved. Everybody actually, believe it or not, the community has a say in what I do. If I, they're the ones who are going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Like, at the end of the day. And um, it's, I need the support. Of yeah. Everyone. And, and I'm not going to just make a pen because I want to make it. I, I want to make a pen that they want to see. I work yeah. I don't work for me. I work for people. Yeah. So it's, um, it's important that I do that. A lot of businesses should do that. You might have a really good feeling about something. Mm -hmm. I, I've had good feelings about things. Uh, it's been a massive failure. Just get, get trust, get some trusted people. And um, so I have a few reviewers and um, that are very, very experienced in the industry. And I will share my ideas with them beforehand and they know the industry better than anybody else. So based on their reactions, I'll go further and that'll show the, the public. So yeah, uh, for example. The laser uh, on pens. I was doing that a year before I uh, released them, and I showed um, one of my friends drives from the pencil case blog, and he said, "Got to do it, Ben. You got to do it." And I was like, oh, "I don't know. I'm not sure," because I wasn't sure. I didn't think people would would want to see laser etchings on pens, so I kind of held off and held off and held off. And then I finally did it. Work. And it was a brilliant reaction, and I started uh, doing. Paisley patterns and I started doing school patterns and believe it or not, um, they're my best selling pens. So, um, my, my black pen, um, is my best selling pattern then. And I, I, I originally did not listen, uh, it won't be popular, but, um, I learned that you gotta listen to people and you gotta take input from other people. Yeah. They're not God. Don't tell them everything. You need to, you need to accept outside opinions. And if you do, it will go a lot further and in, in a lot of industries you will go a lot further, a lot quicker. If you just accept other people's opinions and critique and you take it on the chain and you take it well. Yeah. That's the thing. Cause at the end of the day, what's, what's cool is you, you get to connect directly with your potential end buyers for your pens. So they're the ones who are going to you know, potentially buy a product. So they're going to tell you whether or not it's a good idea before you hit the go button on the order and you spend $10,000 of materials and all this stuff and then find out it's a flop. And like we, you see that in, uh, in clothing stores all the time, there's, there'll be racks, discount racks. And like, you see this jacket and you're like, who the, who came up with this color? It's terrible. And there's like 50 of them and they're on for $15. And so maybe someone buys it for a jacket when they're changing the oil into the car. So that's a bad time to find out you had a bad idea. You can do that ahead of time and get input and you know, they'll ask a few questions and sometimes ones you're like, oh, that's a, that's a good question actually. And then you look into it and all of a sudden six months later, they're like, boom, that thing is out now. And, uh, they, cause also uh, they're going to feel attached to it because maybe they had a little part with, um, voting for their favorite color or and material or sizes, or just, are you going to do this type of nib or that nib? Like you can find out and it's, it's great for you, you know, trying to make stuff. You don't want to make duds, but it's great for users because they want to get what they want. Yeah. It, it, it also, in a way, it actually makes things more cost effective. So I don't have to spend as much time or wasting time and spending money on failures. And um, if I am more successful based on, um, the opinions of my, 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 my end users, I don't have to invest as much money. And if I don't have to invest as much money, I can make my product cheaper. And so it, it, it actually is, um, very beneficial for everybody in the community. Yeah. Get their opinions. If, if there's other makers out there that want to like get their opinions from people, that, that means that they don't have to make as many mistakes. They don't have to invest as much into materials they can just you know 
focus in on one thing, do that very, that one thing very well. And so wait a second, you're saying social media can be used for more than posting pictures of what you eat or doing the shuffle dance. Absolutely. Wow. What? It's, it's the biggest marketing tool. It's, it's the second biggest marketing tool in the world and Google search engine is the biggest marketing tool. And then second, social media. What an idea. <laughs> so it's great to have that at your disposal. You know, it's huge. And then you, you can connect with other people from around the world and all of a sudden now you're buddies and you help each other out with, uh, with something, which is, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. Social media has been very important to me in helping me, um, have a global reach when it comes to connections and not just, uh, having, um, marketing, but you know, we can connect to every corner of the globe and through social media, I, I would consider social media, I was able to connect with yourself and mm -hmm. um, I've seen your videos and I reached out and from doing that, I, I've, but you've got a huge knowledge base as well. I've, by just reaching out, asking questions, I would consider you, I, I've made this post before, but I know a guy and you'd be one of the guys that would know things. And if I needed to know something when it comes to optics or when it comes to fun measurements. You're the guy that I would ask, and you have more than just optics. You've got so much knowledge and I would get everybody's opinion. Um, all the, all the people that I would consider experts in their fields. Um, that's been social media that's helped me. A lot of it's also been, I'm, I'm just very good at finding people and I will. Well, that comes from desire though, as well and focus. And yeah. Like you, you yeah. really have a desire to get this thing figured out. Like we're not yeah. going home today until this car starts, right? Like it's now it's three in the morning and boom, the engine fires up. So it's the same thing. If you want a, an answer to a design thing you're working on or how is this going to work? That's it. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And th th that brings me to another point. Like if I'm, if I'm designing something and I can't just, I can't figure it out. I can't just get it right. I will sit on that design and I will think about it and I will get in contact with people and I will ask questions. Mm -hmm. I won't just release something until it's absolutely perfect. Sometimes I'll look over it. I'll literally have my laptop sat in front of me, arms crossed, just looking at a design, figuring it out. And sometimes like my girlfriend might come out and see me just staring at my laptop. Be okay. I'm like, yeah. The but me working is just a bit of a screen sometimes, but that's what I do. And that's how yeah. I do it. Well, cause they're, you're building it in your mind at that point. And you're just thinking of every possible thing. What if someone does this with it? Oh, wait, what if someone puts this type of ink? I didn't think about that. I, you yeah. know, maybe you forgot to think about, oh, how is this coding with iron gall inks? I didn't even think about that, you know, and then you, and that, that comes in that sometimes 45 minutes stare at one drawing and the drawing's okay, but your mind went on a tangent and you're way over here now, <laughs> six yeah. months from now where the pen's delivered and you thought you happened to get the thought. I didn't confirm if iron gall inks are okay with this coating. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that you have to consider other than just usability, like what can go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You have to think about the, the, the what ifs and every single possible what ifs you have to think about it and there's been times where i haven't thought about all the what ifs of course not this happened um you know i have made mistakes and that's why i sit and stare and you're trying your best <laughs> trying not to make mistakes but i, I want to definitely point out that oh i've made mistakes i've i've and i and it hurts is this you're trying what do you want to do Okay. <laughs> I've been so many times, many, many times. I just want to let everybody know that I have made mistakes and some of these mistakes you have never seen. And sometimes, um, the mistakes have, um, been released and I didn't realize until it was too late, but that has happened. And, um, I own my mistakes. I'll, I'll be the first person to say, yep, I made a mistake there. I'll do my best to fix it, make things good. And but from them mistakes, 
really sure I won't make them again. Mm-hmm. The more I do this, the more I make because I'm making pens quickly. I'm learning quickly. And every pen is the next test. Can I, can I point out the one mistake I found? Oh, yeah, go on, point that in. Um, so this is the, the pocket, the pocket pen that you got. Really enjoy it, like super great. He was even spinning on the table and realized it landed on the flat. And he's, you're like, oh, you're the first guy to point that out. Um, so there's all these little things I noticed and you're just like waiting to see if I found the Easter eggs, the little nuggets. And every time I do, you have a little smile. And so there was one, I said, you know, it's so good, but I did find one teeny little, like an air quoted flaw or mistake. And you replied with it instantly. And it was the logo is not exactly 180 degrees to the flat spot. It is off kilter about two degrees, one and a half, two degrees, something like that. And you, it's such an obscure thing to notice. Um, but you right away goes, oh yeah, the logo is off like a couple degrees. I'm like, <laughs> and you mentioned I'm also the only person that brought that up. And uh, you yeah. can just tell how that came, you know, and then, but then you go, okay, it's a tiny thing that only Doodlebud noticed, but you noticed it too. And then you go, okay, no one else will probably know about this, but I have, it's, it can be off. I didn't check one thing. It was off by a couple of degrees once. And now I yeah. was asked to fix that. So how that happened was, and um, it goes into a machine and um, a laser etching machine, it was a jig and, um, you know, it just blasts and the, the logo onto it, but, um, there's no way of checking directly perfectly in the middle of that. So we was going into the machine and was getting laser etched and thousands of pens got laser etched. And then I, I, I'm not entirely sure how many have the logo slightly off center, but I'd say a couple of hundred of them are slightly off center. And so that is a mistake that we made. And the mistake was that we didn't have some kind of a check uh, to make sure that that was perfectly on center. But now we have a new jig that has basically it centers itself onto this jig. And there's also an arrow, pointed arrow that shows the exact center point. And if it laser etches off center, see straight away. So mm. fix that, that it's now fixed. Your alignment fixture for your laser. I, <laughs> there's, yeah. I, I can't remember how many alignment fixtures for lasers I built, but that's one of the things. You know, first thing we're starting off with aligning lasers. Um, yeah, you got to have the alignment fixture, have a reference, and boom, you start there. So yeah, that came up. You're like, oh, got to do that. So now you got to you fix it. Yeah. So anybody that has one of the one of the steel pens or one of the brass pens or one of the copper pens, have a look. See if you have an Easter egg. Might be off by two degrees, which is yeah. a, that's a collectible. It's a limited edition. Yeah, it's a limited edition off center. Uh, it, make, it must still make your eye twitch every now and then because someone's going to now probably leave a comment. Oh, I got one of those. And your eye will just, yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I'm over it. I had, a small, <laughs> I had a small panic attack when I saw it because um, I had sold a lot of pens before I realized myself because uh, I was doing some photography and I, you know, I sat some pens out. I was like, hold on a second. And I, and I was like, oh, that one's okay. And then I got to go to bed and I'm like, Oh no. Oh no. So it would be one then I could have gone and checked every single pen and to make sure that wasn't off center. But then it's not it's not a deal breaker. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the logo um is just a logo. What what the machining that's going into the pen, the design and uh, yeah. that's going into the pen, all those things are what's important. The logo is just superficial. That's all it is. So it won't spontaneously combust. If your logo is off kilter two degrees, don't worry. You're good. If you have, if you have OCD, um, be aware, you should just let you know. It's a warning. It should come with a warning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, I don't even want to put them up on it. Um, uh, but I have to, um, it's very important that you do label your work. Of course. I'll have, I'll have, um, thanks. Left turning center. Yeah. So we, they can copy my logo. It's so simple. So <laughs> it's a gopher. I don't care. This is not, um, I know it's a liquidation, by the way, guys, please don't copy my pen. <laughs> One thing we were, uh, ch- we sort of talked about it too, is just the importance of having, like, you are 
uh, like a one man, a one man show essentially. But even though you are like that, you have a team, like you talked a little bit about yeah, that. I, I know a guy and, and be able to lean onto people and trust they'll give a direct, honest opinion, not tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And if you need to, if you have a design challenge or a machine challenge or material challenge, you can work together because at the end of the day, you know, especially like with your manufacturers, with your suppliers, with your machinists, you got to have good relationships because your machine, if you, if you throw something at him that there's an issue that you didn't notice, but he does, he has to feel okay to bring that up to you and not that you're going to yell at him. Right. Yes. So just make it, you're the machinist. I'm the designer. Just make the damn pen. He, you have to have that relationship and, and vice versa across all your suppliers and, and people that you interact with. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I've spent quite a long time finding the right people and like a quick example is, so I, I went through six manufacturers that made my pens and I had prototypes made in every single one of them factories and, um, until I found one and they were just better than everybody else. They were more expensive, but the quality was there, you know, the communication was there and, and they weren't afraid to say, look, I think there's a better way to do this. And that's what I wanted. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't have an ego and uh, maybe a little ego. I don't have a massive ego where I think that I know everything. I know a lot of surface knowledge. But it's only surface knowledge. There is people out there that have been doing one specific thing in this industry for all their lives. And you better believe that they know a lot more than you. Never gonna know than them. So I have a lot of guys, a lot of guys that I trust, a lot of men and a lot of women. So when it comes to machining, I have I have one guy actually. His name is Paul. He's a he's a technician in I think it's Ottawa College, but he is a machinist and he's worked in so many different industries and he knows his stuff. He's also a pen collector. So he knows pens and he knows machining. So he is my guy when it comes to machining. I have any question I need to know, he has the answer. And if he doesn't have the answer, he'll find out the answer for me. And you need people like that when it comes to the guy that actually machines the pens. His name is Kevin and Kevin, it is, you know, vastly experienced in the industry as well. And the company that he used to work for, um, was probably the top machining company in China when it comes to pens and they make pens for everybody, everybody that they shouldn't be making pens for, they are, are making pens for. And so, and uh, Kevin will see this, but so he will, I can't say who he has made pens for, but believe me. The pen on that table right there on your table, or a pens on this table. And um, so that is how he, he, he makes, he has massive experience and he's my guy when it comes to me and I can call Kevin up and say, Kevin, I have an idea. I want to put this coding on a pen and he'll say, right, let's do this. And he doesn't know how to do it. And I don't know how to do it, but between the two of us. He'll know somebody, I don't know somebody, and we meet get it the dots. Yeah, exactly. I have so many people, so many experts that I know when it comes to polymers and when it comes to photography, when it comes to marketing, there's people that help me, you know, I, I reach out, I don't do this all on my own. And that is something that everybody in the industry should do. You want to know something, reach out to somebody that might be an expert in that field and you'll get a lot further, a lot quicker. I, I see a lot of uh, makers and they don't, they don't, um, they don't ask enough questions and they're, they're not really, uh, excelling as quickly as they would by just simply asking somebody that knows people are very happy to help. I'm one of those people that's very happy to help other people. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other people that are, you know, for the people that have spent 40 years learning these things. They, they want to tell somebody what they do. Yeah, they don't no, want to ask them. They have some yeah, weird they, role and they know everything about that little thing, but no one cares about that little thing until Ben Walsh happens to go, Hey, I heard you're the pro in this. And they're like, yes. And they want to tell you everything about it. They're a life story. 
and because you're willing to listen because no one's ever asked them about their weird obscure work before yeah like i'll give you an example i wanted to make a new feed a new type of plants out of dalaran and dalaran is you know it's super vitro um hydrophobic so that means ink won't stick to it but how do you make this hydrophilic i didn't know i hadn't a clue and i did a bit of google searching and i found a guy and then i found a guy that was like the guy the expert in this field and i called him and i i actually got his phone number and i called him I said look i have this crazy idea and he's like okay cool that's really cool and then he just told me so much information mm-hmm. because it's not every day he gets a phone call asking for you know his speciality which was um and using plasma plasma treatments yeah and, and he, he works for the medical device industry the medical device industry in Ireland is huge, but he only does one thing. And, you know, when I came to him and said, look, I've got this other thing, and he was really excited about it. And he was so happy to just help me. And, you know, that's, that's just one example of dozens and dozens of times where I've reached out to somebody and they've said, okay, cool. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. And it's, you know, like me and you, we can talk for hours. Just yeah. Talk. So many different things. If we could talk about measurements, yeah, for something, two hours, because we did. It was nice, and that's how we. <laughs> and we both learn, and that's the thing. Like, you get to have this conversation. If you work at a large company, let's say that's uh, like the company, the first company I was at was I don't know, I think it was like four or five thousand people, all like super tech engineers, just galore, and. If you want to know the answer to that, someone's like, oh, yeah, no, we got a guy. He's, uh, yeah, go go talk to Carl. He's he's down on the bottom floor over by this lab. Uh, he's the guy. And, oh, okay, great. So go talk to him, get the answer. And if you need to know something about chemistry, go go talk to Ernesto. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He knows all about that stuff. You go talk to him. He knows everything. And this guy knows electronics. This guy knows, like, there's just, this lady is, like, the, the uh, specialist on knowing you know, how to have proper ventilation, you know, to make sure chemicals aren't going to kill everyone in the lab. So she'll, you're going to do some crazy spray coating. This is who you talk to. And she knows how to make sure no one gets, you know, poisoned from this stuff. Like there's all those people, but when you're doing it, you know, oh, solo mio by yourself, you don't have all these people that you can just go talk to any terror you want in the company. And you're all supposed to help each other to make the products. It's, it's, you're doing it yourself, but you know, I, and I guess it's without social media, you probably couldn't have been able to do this, be able to just look someone up on LinkedIn or Instagram, or you see a video on YouTube, then you learn about that person, then you try to connect. And it's even kind of cool. Like through this process, I got to reconnect with Dan Gilbert. I thought about it, but then just chatting to you and a little more about engineering and do my channel, it got me kind of really excited uh, to get back in touch. I got to, you know, re- reconnect with Dan Gilbert, who was like super awesome guy that, totally jacked me up. We'd spent three hours nerding out together, talking about engineering and gave him your pen. And now there's just, that's kind of sparked my ideas on other things for pens. And, um, you know, I came, I told you about my little idea for a vanishing retractable nib pen. That was a weird idea I came up with. And so that's, what's great. As you talked about is, is just having that sort of community, whether it's yeah. with your manufacturers or just other people in the industry, it's just apps like it's, you're not going to have a great product unless you have those people at arm's reach. Yeah, you, you really need the right people um, behind you. And um, like, with, even when it comes to a manufacturer, um, if you find one manufacturer that says, yeah, we'll make these pens, get seven different ones. Go to several different companies. Do not settle on just one person because you never know. They, they might be okay, but are they the best? I've seen it in the, a few different makers have gotten ends made. They're only okay. And it's because they're machining, they're, they've gone to a certain machine shop that is optimized to do one thing, but hence. So what they've made is industrial rather than volume. So it's a really well-made industrial and not a very well-made volume tool. Mm-hmm. It's very important. It really is important. You can find it the right coding company. Like there's coding companies that will do an okay job. And then there's co- coding companies that will do the best job. You yeah. Know, well, you can't cheap out of these things. And sometimes it's just, I, I spent years trying to find the right coding company. 
only 22 weeks ago, I, I, I showed you that email. That new coding. Yeah. But I, I'm getting this new coding uh, on my pen. It's, it's, um, it's a titanium silicon nitride coating and it's, it's just, but I originally saw this coating, it's a blue coat and there's many ways to get a blue coating on it. And most of these coatings are very, very high end and they're for tools, they're for putting tools, for milling tools. This is the type of tooling that you use to put ink in it. You know, it's, it's crazy hard materials. And I, I went to these companies, I went to every one of these companies and said, look, I'm making this pen and I wanted to have this super hard coating that you're, you're making. And basically said, no, don't do decorative coatings. And I said, no, it's not decorative function. And they just said, no, we won't do it. For five years, for five years, I tried to get this coating. And uh, my guy, Kevin, he found a company. I found someone. <laughs> yeah, he, he found someone. So it's, it's about knowing the right guy. That, that's a really good example. So Kevin found a guy that was willing to do this coating on my pen. And I jumped on that opportunity. Five years trying to get it. Yeah. So you were like, how could I get this done? And five years later, you're like, we got it. Yeah. And not just any coating. This coding is insane and I can talk about coding all day long, but <laughs> coding, what it does, the color, you, you know, I, I always joke about it. set my pen on fire, be fine. Set this thing on fire, set it on fire and sand it. If you want nothing to happen, you can literally take a file to this pen and it will dull your file. That's how strong this coating is yeah you 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 you'll make this pen go red hot you can actually heat the pen up until the melting point and only then will it fail so it it, it will it will stay four thousand five hundred vickers to one thousand one hundred degrees yeah that is it's hard for people to understand exactly what that is but the metal is starting to get saw yeah, it's starting to yield. Yeah, but the coating still stays, still stays standing. <laughs> and it's sort of like, and for people that don't get it, you go like, but why does that matter? Who cares? But it's it's sort of like the Everest. It's like, why do you need to climb it? And it's like, because it's there. And like, why do you need that coating? Because you're like, it's just sweet. It's just better. There's all these features that don't matter on a pen because we're just in the in our office writing. But it's just like, but it's, it's better. That's, that's, you know, an improvement. Yeah. So, um, a, a very good reason uh, why it happens, right? So you have a vintage pen there. So yep. the market that you have, you know, that's, that's a bit battered. It's actually in really good condition, right? But it's not gonna need too much work. Yeah. But there's a lot of vintage pens that have been used every day, right. 20, 30 years, and they literally just fall apart after a certain amount of time because they, they just can't perform um, as well as um, a pen with a, the materials, you know, they have their limitations. They're beautiful materials, but that material has its limitations. Mm -hmm. Now the materials that we have today. So some of the polymers that we have today. Um, so for example, Dalaran was, um, it only was invented in the 1960s, I believe, but Dalaran. If you make a pen out of Dalaran and you use it every day, it'll get you dings and, you know, might, it might actually polish up rather than dull. In 200 years, Dalaran is perfect. Yeah. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to have degraded. And when it comes to the coatings and pens, like, uh, if you have a solid silver pen in a hundred years, you know, it's going to be half the size of the ones because silver just wastes the wind. Well, the titanium pen that you have there, that grade five titanium pen, that is super indestructible. You know, that clip, that's a very, very hard clip made to last. In 100 years and 200 years, that pen is not going to look much different. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty much the same. And it won't take much work to make it polished again if it does get dinged up. And, you know, it's got a beautiful anodized coating at the moment. I, I could just dip it in hydrofluoric acid and give it a brand new shiny coating. Yeah, It'll yeah. Brand new again. Yeah, and that's the difference between modern day materials and vintage materials. Yeah. 
it's not a dig on vintage. Oh, Jesus, I can go off on a tangent here, but I won't. But it's yeah. not a- vintage are great, but yeah, it's just like, you know, if they had the material capability, machining capability in 1930 that we have today, a 1930s pen would probably look a little bit different. Um, uh-huh. I zoom with it, it's going crazy there, but yeah. So yeah, material, so it's, um, so we wanted to try to keep it an hour-ish. We're, we're, I think, very close to that right now. So I yeah. thought, let's just chat a little bit about your, your final QC. So now you got a pen that you came up with the design and all these materials and coatings, and you got relationships with people. You've learned everything you need to learn. You got a pen, the batch came through, everything's awesome, but you got to make sure it gets to the customer and it's just perfect. You don't want any failures or complaints, ideally. It's going to happen. It's just, you get no one bats a hundred. But yep. uh, just talk maybe uh, uh, five minutes or so on QC. I know you, you inspect every nib and uh, just take us through that. So well, I should start, you know, QC starts in the factory. So Evan would have, there's a, I don't know what it's called, but there's this optical device that will check each pen over a master. So they'll take maybe one out of every 10 bands. It's actually one of. I think it's one of every 10 pens they'll take and they'll check and they'll verify that it's the correct dimensions. And then the next step is a visual inspection. So every single pen gets a visual inspection. Like when the, the pen drops into the part, into the parts bin, sometimes it can like knock off something else. And get it. um, there's a quick visual inspection and if they catch something, it gets thrown out. Some get through and that just happens. It's a human error. Um, so the pens that get to me, you know, 99% of the pens are A-OK, but 1%, you know, might have slight imperfection. And I'm visually inspecting every single pen, um, but I'm inspecting sometimes 60, 70 pens a day. And, you know, it's, it's a long, tedious work. I'm inspecting, I'm inspecting, inspecting threads. I do, a, you know, a quick check of everything. Um, and I, I, I'm the first to admit that I, I do miss things and I have, um, I, I have missed a lot of things, but I do, do try my best. I don't use a computer. I don't use any sort of the algorithms to check the laws. Because some of the big manufacturers have scanners, like uh, Lamy has a, a, a wonderful setup and you've very, very difficult Lamy to miss something. So the, the, the quality that comes out of them. It is insane. What I they used to make those, those type of devices, you know, so yeah, a yeah. lot of times there'll be laser scanners and we would have ones that will go down to, we'd be picking up six, seven micron details and to inspect parts. Yeah. And those things cost money. A lot they, of money. Yeah, and they, for you to get one of those, it's like, you can't do that. Not yet. Someday. Maybe. No, I don't, I don't ever, I don't intend to ever take human element out of it. And um, I, I love the human element and I think that's important. It will reflect on the price of my pens because, um, you know, I'm going to be introducing all sorts of materials and you can't, you just can't have an optical jacking device. It's just humans. Uh, you're just going to have to visually jack it. But some of the other things I do in Solana, um, I used to actually take a picture every single prior to, so I take, so I'd assemble the pen, I'd hold the pen up, take a picture. And with the persons, um, their label, their label on the packaging in the background. So I literally know the pen going into that package. And that was my, my way of optically checking afterwards if there was a problem with the pen. And I got a customer saying, oh, I bent a little ding here. And I'd look into the picture and I'd see if I saw the ding, I'm like, gosh, missed <laughs> something, you know, and that's just, I'm a human. So, you know, what's it like to go through and you got, maybe there's a, a hundred pens checking out, like, do your eyes go a bit wonky checking every nib and, and checking every finish and polishing every pen and polishing every nib? Yeah. Again, every, every order is different. So I'm packaging yeah, a different pen every single time. And so there's a different check for every single type of finish. So anodizing isn't as refined as a high polished uh, copper pen. So. I actually have to polish and polish every copper pen, every brass pen. I try to, you know, wrap them up in uh, acid-free paper to make sure that they don't. Uh, yeah, so the tissue, this one, uh, 
I think, I think it was this one. It had tissue paper on it too. Yeah. So that's a special type of paper. And yeah. um, so in machine jobs, they use a special type of acid free paper and they wrap the parts up on it and it generally keeps the oxygen away. And yeah. that's that's the event. So I ship my pens, a, my own custom acid free paper. Um, and it, 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 it looks cool. It's branded. Yeah. Kind of nice, nice feature. That's one, that's one of the things I do. Yeah. I, I visually check every single mid. And um, if there's ever in this long time or if there's any, anything. And um, so I've got all the tools to fix the nib. So I've got the gauges. So the gauges. Yeah. Are just, Super know. handy. Yeah. They, they, that's probably, I use that a hundred times a day. Yeah. It's just the quickest, fastest. And like, once you learn how to use a set of field gauges, even though like it's half thousandths of an inch increment that we do, we chatted about thou and microns. Yeah. for 15 minutes the other day <laughs> when, oh, when I like to use thousands and when I like to use millimeters, but anyways, yeah. um, but you know, there's a pretty good resolution on these already, but if you know how to use them, you can at least get two to four times better resolution. If you just know what it feels like and, uh, which is so amazing what you can do with something like this. So, so at the end of the day, you're just trying to do one last final check to make sure nobody wants to get a pen you know, open it up and there's a ding on it. They want it to be perfect. And then they want it to, you know, check it out. Everything's great. Put ink in it. And then it writes perfectly. Cause uh, for us pen folks, if we get one teeny thing off, we, we absolutely lose our minds and you get a one-star review. So you, so, uh, you know, you're trying your absolute best. So that doesn't happen. And, uh, it's, you know, it's especially bad. It can, you know, I don't expect much from a $3 pen. I'm surprised when I get one and the thing's like perfect. Um, but all of a sudden if someone shell out some really good money and there's some pens out there that are hundreds and hundreds and they're over a thousand dollars and they pick it up, ink it, they're so excited. And that's after tax money they used, right? And they go to write and it's dry or it's scratchy. You're like, what gives, man? How much money do I have to spend to get a good pen? Yeah. And like, look, it, it has happened. I yeah, and, and, uh, you know, everything looked good, but then they've just, uh, you know, sometimes there's a, a tiny microscopic piece of dust under the nib that's impeding ink flow. And that's it. Instantly, a customer is just so dissatisfied. Yeah. You, you know, I've done my, my best and um, as best as I can, but still, you know, you, you do have customers that are happy and that happens. And um, well, it's how you deal with that customer. It kind of like shows what your business is really about. Yeah. So you have a problem with a pen. Oh, no. You want to know? Oh, yeah. I'll say, oh, please let me know. Can you show me pictures? You know, if there's a, if there's a, a, an issue with a nib, I'm like, okay. Um, I'll send you a new nib out. Um, you know, I'll test this one before I send it out. You know, you know, that's part of the quality control. But quality control is also fixing states. Right? Yeah. Sometimes things slip by. And you gotta, you gotta fix them. Yeah. And it could even be something as simple, uh, as thermal expansion, right? So your yeah. pen leaves your house and let's say it's 20 degrees Celsius, but then it's going go into an airplane, go up to 36,000 feet. That thing's going to get quite cold. It's got a steel nib on it. And then it's going to come back down again and maybe go up a few times, a few different flights, right? So it's going back up to grounds and outlands in Texas and it's uh, 43 degrees Celsius. For there a little while, it's smoking hot in the airplane, and it goes back up to thirty six thousand feet, and it's like minus five degrees Celsius. So it's going to thermal cycle several times, and then get to someone in Arizona or someone in Iceland or wherever, and just that simple thermal cycling. If there was any stress left in the nib when it was manufactured, because they're shaped, and you're going to get stresses in the materials, that thermal cycling can be enough to go doink, and all of a sudden the tines are off a touch. Absolutely. And it has happened. Um, you know, I visually check every single nib. Um, and I can say that um, I've never let a nib go, go uh, leave without me making sure that the nibs, uh, the, the tires are aligned. Yeah. But I've had customers that, you know, they've um, taken the pen out and they went right with it. And it's a scratchy nib. It's because something's misaligned. And, you know, I absolutely know I've checked the nib. And the last thing I do before I put that cap on, I put it under the loop. One more time. Yeah. And I'm checking it in different, different positions and that's it. You know, I, I, I absolutely know that I've never sent a missile uh, 
at Nibet, but when it gets to the customer and it's misaligned, you know, you know, after, you know, several thousand pounds, I've had it happen a few times. So I can, yeah. I, and we know, we know how materials can react and change in heat cycles. So we know that that is, an, it's an actual thing. That yeah. And thermal expansion we, is real. That we, I used to a hundred percent of our scanners would go out. You couldn't send a new USB cable to a customer without a 14 hour thermal cycle, a, a thermal chamber cycle. And yeah. so we would have our optic systems cause you got, maybe it's, it's a cast iron body and it's got an aluminum optical mount and maybe there's a carbon fiber part or something, you know, out of GTA, whatever it is, there's all these different materials in there. So they all have their own thermal coefficient expan expansion coefficient. And so we're aligning you know, optics and lasers, but what you're going to find out if, if a screw isn't tightened, right. If someone missed a washer, something's off a touch, the glue didn't seat and there's a burr under a two mating surfaces. You drop that to minus 20 plus 50 minus 20 plus 50 for 14, 15 hours. And you, we would pull all the data off the, uh, the cameras and watch the lasers and they will move a bit, but all, they, there's a mathematical amount they should, but we could, we could spot if there was a camera and a screw or a washer, was it perfectly aligned and seated? We would see something drift the wrong way and go, damn it. And you go in, you find, ah, there's a burr on the bottom of this thing. And now you got to take it apart, you know, do all that stuff, put it through a test jig and then chuck it in the chamber again. And then after that, a vibratory uh, table. And then you got to shake the hell of it to make sure that's, if the thermal cycle didn't do it, let's see if we can break it on the vibra vibration table. Yeah. And so there's, you know, there's only so much you can do. And especially you, you can't possibly thermal cycle all your nibs. And, the whole, and it wouldn't be necessary for what we're doing. Yeah, even I'd have to turn those like the one after, I mean, the parents, because yeah. when, when you put a, a new screw in, in the housing, it, there's a new stress on it. And I, yeah. I always wiggle check it. I always try to take the stress out of it. And as soon as you do that, you put in a new stress on it. As soon as you do are, you know, try to align the times, it's a new stress that you put in. You know, and the, I can't, it's not possible. Well, it is possible to do a thermal cycle. But it's what's possible. nice. <laughs> That's, That's you know, like, do people want to pay an extra twenty dollars for pen, knowing that you thermal cycle them all? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> all right? I'll send you a new nib, buddy. <laughs> Don't worry, that's yeah. way cheaper for you just to send someone a new nib every now and then, or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I think we we went through that pretty hardcore. Um, I'd say you know we're getting close to the hour, like an hour fifteen. We're planning for an hour, so okay, we're close. Um, let's wrap things up. I thought the, the last thing to maybe wrap it up with is, you know, if there's one thing you'd want people to know, you know, uh, your current customers, potential ones, or ones who just watch your stuff on Instagram, will never buy a pen from you, whatever people who are interested about fountain pens. Um, what is one thing, uh, that you would want them to know about you and your pens? Oh, this is like a chance where you get to sell myself. If I were to guess what it is, if I were to guess what it is, and then you can, you can say, no, that's not it. But if I were to guess, it's like this, this is your best effort at making a really good pen. I think people oh, like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Obviously. So yeah. Um, there's the only one person that can really confirm how relentless I am in what I do is my girlfriend. But I am, um, yeah, I will, I'll stay up until. Three in the morning, most days, get up like eight, nine in the morning, most days. And I'm working on designing pens and making pens. And I do that every single day. Maybe I might take the odd Sunday off, but I'm putting that effort in to making the best pen I can. And I don't release a pen until I'm absolutely 100% sure. I will sit on it designing for a year if I have to until I get it right. And that goes into every single one of my pens. And I, I, I will work on it for months and months. And I won't release it until it's perfect. I'll spend thousands and thousands of euros trying to make sure that I give the best part of my customers. And I do that for, for everything. And if I don't believe something is good enough, I scrap it. And I have done, I have a box of thousands and titanium, pen, <laughs> titanium pens that I just feel good enough. I did at one point, 
planned to release a titanium pen, but it wasn't good enough. I made that mistake of, um, not prototyping enough. But, um, yeah, that, like, that's what I did. I got I have a bag of 400 Skittle bands that don't feel are good enough, finished. <laughs> and that's, that's just part of what I do. Yeah. I, people need to know that like I, I will throw out, I will lose money before I send you something imperfect. Yeah. I'll damage my, I'll, I'll, I'll financially take it before I take, before I upset a customer. I do that every time. Look, I can't please everybody, but I do try my best. Try my best. I'm, I am only human. I'm a one man band. Um, so yeah, just remember that when you send me an angry email. Uh, it's going I'm, right to you. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it's going right to me, but I, I'm, I'm trying as best as I can. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is hard. It is hard. It's very stressful. And it's not, it's not just running a pen business, you know, and it's, there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm doing a lot behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Yeah. Just part of running a business. And when you've had a hard day, believe me, I've had a hard day. <laughs> Take it easy. You almost burnt your, your eyes out from the lasers a few times. Uh, I have, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so I'm checking on the time. So it is like uh, one twenty here in the morning here. And, uh, you know, I just realized I, the record stopped about 20 minutes ago, I think. April <laughs> Fools. Look at that. It's, it's, oh, it's April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got me. Ah. Gotcha. Well, I had to do it somehow. But anyway, so we'll wrap it up there. Uh, and, um, you know, one question we, we thought of throwing out to people watching, you know, they can ask whatever question they, they want or leave whatever comments, I should say. But uh, let us know if the, you know, if, if viewers would like us to chat again. Um, cause we can go crazy deep on all sorts of different topics and, uh, you know, we would love a little feedback to know, would they like to see us again, um, talking more about different topics if they like this kind of chat, when it comes to learning about fat and pens, um, we're, we're obviously both game cause we love talking about technical stuff and geeking out. So this is fun for us. And if you guys want to see it, let us know in the comments. So, um, I guess it's uh, about nine, something I quarter after nine, your time. Yeah. Yeah. So I should probably get a little sleep because I got to get up super early. You got to catch a ferry. I go to Victoria tomorrow. Well, today I should say. So uh, we'll leave it there for now. Thank you for uh, spending time with your buddy here and all the viewers and get be able to connect with them as well. And uh, leave it there, buddy. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you got me on the April Fool's. I was a bit. I, I don't. <laughs> you got me.